We were into the subject of mysticism in the Middle Ages, and we were looking at Catherine of Siena when uh, uh, time ran out on us. And um, we had mentioned uh, that uh, supposedly Christ had appeared uh, to Catherine of Siena and asked her to be his bride. He gave her a ring, uh, and then the, she then asked for the stigmata. We talked about what the stigmata were. Uh, I mentioned uh, Padre Pio to you. Uh, a lot of people from New York that are uh, Italian um, would know Padre Pio. Uh, there have, there's a tradition down through um, the past number of centuries of these stigmata, these uh, bloody wounds on the hands, uh, the feet, the side, uh, as a sign of one's uh, extremely close spiritual relationship to, uh, to Christ. Um, she went to Florence and negotiated a peace between Florence and Avignon. Uh, pretty unusual for a woman at this time period. Remember, the scholastics are arguing about whether women have souls. Um, so when, uh, when they may be arguing about whether you've got a soul or not, you come along and you have such uh, authority uh, that you can uh, negotiate a, a peace between Florence and Avignon. That's pretty interesting. She entreated the Pope to bring the papacy back to Rome. Uh, this was during the period of the Avignon papacy, the Babylonian captivity of the church. Uh, she survived an attack of smallpox. Uh, she wrote great amounts of epistolary literature, uh, letters to people uh, with... Uh, spiritual insights and counseling and so on and so forth. Um, and, of course, given the time period when she died, her head was made a relic. Uh, that's not overly shocking. Uh, some of you seem shocked this early in the morning, but um, isn't there some, some dude's hand is touring uh, Canada right now? Uh, so uh, that kind of thing. I mean, uh, for most of us, especially we go into Eastern countries in Europe, but there's some in Western countries too, but especially in the East when you go into some of these monasteries and the monasteries are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old and all the monks that have ever lived there, their skulls line the hallways, you know, um, freaks us out pretty good, uh, uh, but that's, that's, the way, uh, that's the way things were done. So her head was made a, a relic. Uh, she was canonized, of course, made the patron saint of Rome, and in the 1960s, she was made a doctor of the church. Now, a doctor of the church in Roman Catholicism is an individual who had just an incredibly extraordinary impact upon uh, the course of the church down to the centuries, is uh, what that is a recognition of. So, when someone's made a doctor of the church, um, their writings had had and continue to have, and as a result will have more influence within uh, Roman Catholicism. So uh, Catherine of Siena, very well known that time period. Uh, another in that time period is Meister, Meister Eckert, 1260 to 1327. Meister Eckert, 1260 to 1327. He's the father of German mysticism. Uh, he was a powerful preacher. His theology was heterodox even given the standards of that day. Uh, he distinguished between Gott und Gottheit, between God and Godhood. Godhood is the simple essence having in itself the potentiality of all things. And so there's sort of a almost new agey force type idea there, you know. Uh, may the Gottheit be with you as you get out your lightsaber. Um, and... Uh, it is interesting uh, that uh, when you look at the mainline denominations in the United States as they liberalized over the past, wow, century and a quarter now, um, in the last century, which, you know, didn't we just have, you know, the switch over to 2000? Yeah, that was 18 years ago. Uh, anyway, uh, you look at... at what happens when a uh, denomination is liberalizing and they'll always become attracted to the mystics 
because once you no longer have a supernatural revelation from God in Scripture, once your view of Scripture has become so uh, minimalized that it's you know, no longer really what we believe it to be, you have to start looking for other things. And it's interesting to me that uh, many of the you know, spiritual retreats that you'll find uh, in United Methodism or in the liberal Lutherans or the liberal Presbyterians um, will feature the writings of Meister Eckert or Catherine of Siena or Thomas of Kempis or Teresa of Avila or Julia of Norwich and so on and so forth. Uh, sort of re- rediscovering these, uh, these people. And especially today, because you can really do a lot of... These guys were really memeable, if you, if you know what memeing is, if you know what a meme is. Uh, their writings would just be filled with easy-to-make memes um, that you could disconnect from all the rest of theology and make it sound really, uh, really, really cool. Um, Thomas Akempis, 1380 to 1471 probably wrote one of the most famous literary works of the mystics, and that would be The Imitation of Christ. Again, very, very common work uh, in um, uh, any of the retreats and things that are done today that are, have a mystical element to them. Uh, obviously, if you're going to be reading widely in Christian literature, it's one of those works that has to be uh, dealt with, but it's called The Imitation of Christ. Quote, Uh, The goal of all life is to serve Christ in humility, end quote. He founded the Brethren of the Common Life. Um, And his writings had an impact on both Luther and Erasmus in the Reformation, given uh, that he dies in 1471. So you're only talking, you know, 45 years before the beginning of the Reformation and even less before uh, the work of Desiderius Erasmus. So we're starting to become contemporaneous with the earliest reformers uh, at that particular uh, at that particular point likewise around that same time period 1452 to 1498 you'll notice that's only 46 years is a man by the name of Savonarola I might as well write that down so you can look it up Savonarola that's not a D that's an O-L-A Savonarola Uh, a Dominican monk in Florence uh, who had uh, visions uh, and as a result these visions attacked the church and even the papacy uh, denouncing the papacy for its uh, luxuriousness its uh, uh, you know this is after the papacy has been the schism has been healed of course uh, uh, and uh, so at the Council of Constance and so uh, he is a, some people would actually in some ways consider him an early reformer, though the doctrine of the gospel was not really central to uh, his perspective. Um, so what was interesting is uh, an ordeal by fire was arranged for Savonarola. Now, what was an ordeal by fire? Well, uh, the idea was if you're speaking the truth then God will protect you uh, supernaturally. And so a, a gauntlet of fire would be uh, uh, erected. And if you were able to walk through this conflagration um, and make it to the other side, then that means God had, uh, was, was behind your message. Interesting way. It would be interesting to use that for politics today but well anyway um uh (laughs) that would that would get a real large tv audience i think if we had the ordeal by fire for our our politicians um (laughs) don't think that would work brother callahan you're not you're not you're looking a little bit skeptical about uh, about the application of the ordeal by fire but but uh so he's uh, he's all ready to go through this ordeal uh, by fire uh, but his uh, his enemies became afraid. You know, what if this guy, what if this guy makes it through? Then people are all going to turn on us because he's proven to be a prophet of God or something. Uh, and and then when it was about to start, a huge thunderstorm came up and just 
put everything out, soaked everything. And you would think, oh, well, that would vindicate Savonarola. Actually, it was interpreted the other way. Uh, because if God doesn't even allow the event to take place, then he's not allowing this person to prove their truthfulness, and therefore this spelled Savonarola's doom. And as a result, he was um, burned in Florence on May 23rd, 1498. So the, the people took the thunderstorm as evidence that he, his teaching wasn't true and his denunciation of the papacy was false. And so he was burned as a heretic in uh, 1498. Now remember, 1498, now you're, only, you're only talking 19 years before 1517. So uh, very uh, fresh um, in the events coming up to the, uh, the Reformation. Uh, then we have Teresa of Avila, died 1582. So now we're talking about after uh, the Reformation, but she's still considered, again, within the Roman Catholic uh, Church. Spanish, Spanish mystic, later made a doctor of the church, another one of the doctors of the church, another woman. Uh, she was an active reformer of the Carmelites, uh, one of the orders of the Roman Church at the time. Her parents were Jewish converts. Like Catherine, she claimed to have been spiritually married to Christ. She wrote a good bit, even going so far uh, as uh, to get um, wholly inappropriate in her descriptions of her relationship with the Lord, shall we say. Her favorite book was the Song of Solomon. Um, an angel supposedly came and drove a spear into her abdomen, um, as a reformer, she worked tirelessly to eradicate abuses uh, in the Carmelites. She founded 17 convents in Spain, and she counseled women to put away womanish ways to be a man. So there you go, ladies. Uh, be a man is what uh, Teresa of Avila would uh, tell you. Uh, and then we go backwards a little bit to Julian of Norwich, 1342 to 1416, uh, which is interesting. She was a recluse. Remember the pillar saints and people like that back in the early church? Well, she was a recluse who lived in a doorless apartment that had only two windows. And so she's in a, in a church, and I haven't seen this, but my church history professor had seen uh, where this was, and uh, high up on the wall in the church, you'd see this window, and there's an, an apartment up there, and uh, there are only two windows, uh, and that's where food we passed in, and and other things passed out, uh, I guess, um, and uh, this is where she stayed. She received revelations, of course. Um, and in May of 1373, uh, she got one where God told her that she is his wife. And, that, uh, and from that, she wrote a devotional commentary in which she spoke of the motherhood of God. Uh, so in general, uh, living in a one-room apartment with only two windows and never going out may not be good for your overall theological health. Uh, we could sort of gather from that, but of course... In that particular context, she was considered to be a particularly, uh, particularly holy person. And so there's a lot of writings. And again, mysticism, remember, is a reaction against scholasticism. And so people that are sick and tired of reading Peter Lombard or struggling with the ontological argument uh, want to have something that's less cerebral and more emotional. And uh, so I, I think that's one of the reasons why the mystics grab hold of people even today as well, uh, sort of rebellion against the cold, scientific, modern context, uh, looking for something along those lines. So with that, we, uh, we actually uh, start coming to the point of the pre-Reformation reformers. Yes, I'm thrilled, too. I, I heard Sean going, Phew. I can hardly control the excitement. Uh, I realize, uh, I wish, just wish everyone listening could see the, the anticipation on the face of everyone. 
either that or it's just anticipation that we only have 25 minutes left in class. I'm not sure which one that is, but I'm going to interpret it positively as, uh, as just excitement about, uh, about what's coming. Um, Pre-Reformation reformers. Now, again, all of this is somewhat subjective in the sense that uh, how do you define these individuals? How do you define Reformation itself? Um, you know, history allows us to at least see how people in the past have done it, but uh, it doesn't follow that, um, you know, someone had to make a decision at some point. We're going to include these people as the, as the pre-Reformation reformers, and we're going to include these people as staying within the Roman Catholic community. But even then, there's, there's, there, there, there are people, there's sort of a toss-up. I mean, Erasmus throws us a curve because uh, Erasmus was so critical of various things in Roman Catholicism and so strong on scripture and things like that. And yet, uh, he died in communion with the church. He wrote a treatise on transubstantiation. You know, there was, it, it'd be nice if everything was cut and dried and black and white and history is rarely, uh, rarely um, as, as, as easy as, as that. But certainly, uh, most everyone would agree uh, that uh, John Wycliffe was certainly one of the, uh, really the, the bright morning star of the Reformation, you might say. Um, when you see the morning star, and, and it depends on which, what you're identifying, it's not actually a star, but uh, Venus is obviously uh, frequently identified with that. Once in a while, Mercury uh, pops up there. It's not easy to see, but... Um, you, you have that star that tells you that the sunrise is coming. And uh, it's right around the bend. And sort of that's, that's how, John Wycliffe, how John Wycliffe functioned. And I think I've already mentioned to you, but if I, if I didn't, I'll, I'll mention it to you now. Um, now, since we have pretty much just adults in this class, I don't have to worry about this as much as I do when I teach this to a a more mixed audience with young people in it, but um, uh, standardized spelling, having a computer that underlies, underlines your words in red um, is a very new thing. I remember the first time I had a word processor that underlined a word, and I'm like, what's going on? I just thought that was the neatest thing in the world, but I also thought... This could destroy people's ability to spell. And it pretty much has. If memes tell you anything, nothing drives me more insane than to see a really well-thought-out meme and it contains typos. It's just like, oh, stop. Didn't you see it was underlined in red? <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on. Um, but uh, standardized spelling is a fairly modern thing pretty much since Webster, you know, since the 19th century. Um, that's why we go back and we, we read stuff back then and, and we're like, why is it spelled like that? You have to, you know, have to have survived hooked on phonics to even figure out what in the world they were, they were talking about, the way they spelled some words. Uh, in Wycliffe's own hand, uh, scholars have identified 12 different ways of spelling his name by Wycliffe himself. So he spelled Wycliffe 12 different ways. So if, uh, if you ever misspell it, just laugh at the computer. Because <laughs> you're like, you have no idea how anachronistic you're being to, uh, to question my spelling of the name Wycliffe. Because he did it 12 different ways, so uh, I, bet you, I bet you he did it Y way at least once. So... Um, yeah, the easiest spelling for me is W-Y-C-L-I-F, but sometimes it was F-F-E and just all sorts of other fun variants uh, on, uh, on the name. 1328 to 1384. 1328 to 1384. So I guess we put this up there. We can... Uh... So 1328 to 1384. And um, I've often said that if I, was, uh, if I was in charge of history, 
I would have uh, chosen Wycliffe to begin the, uh, the Reformation. He was a brilliant scholar. He uh, had, had, a, had a tremendous insight. Uh, his mind was much more systematic than Luther and uh, things like that. Uh, but the fact of the matter is um, it wasn't time. Uh, as we'll see, there were certain things that had to be in place uh, to bring the Reformation about, especially, especially the printing press. Uh, but also the publication of the first Greek New Testament and a number of things like that had to be in place. It just wasn't time. Uh, that's why he is a pre-Reformation reformer. I don't think that it's uh, a question whatsoever as to where he would have stood uh, had he been a contemporary with Luther or something like that. Um, but the reality is he wasn't. He was uh, well ahead of that time period. Uh, he taught at Oxford uh, and was a priest who pastored at Lutterworth, the parish at Lutterworth. And uh, unlike uh, many priests of the day, he actually took his role as a preacher and pastor of that Parish, despite being the best-known scholar in England at the time, uh, eventually. Um, he took his preaching and teaching duties amongst the people very seriously. It would be very common for people who, who preached in, uh, or taught in universities to sort of, they would hold clerical positions, but actually preaching or Dealing with the hoi polloi, the people of the land, you know, eh, that wouldn't necessarily be their thing. But he, he did actually pastor uh, in Lutterworth while teaching at Oxford. Uh, he worked to get rid of immoral priests, uh, a common problem in England of the day, uh, and really a common problem throughout Europe at that particular time period. Uh, he received his uh, doctorate in 1372, and in 1376, he published a book called On Civil Dominion, a work that was very favorable to the crown and civil government over against papal intrusions. And so, you know, one might say, oh, okay, well, he's getting involved with politics. Remember, um, you, you cannot even begin to get a grasp of the pre-Reformation reformers, the reformers, um, and all the things that take place in their experience um, if you don't understand the concept of sacralism in the state church. Um, and this was, as far back as anybody could remember, this is what Europe was. Uh, sure, it had developed over time. We've seen that development over time. We see it beginning with Constantine, but you know, then over that next century, you know, until Rome is declared a Christian empire and around around 380, you know, it's been well a thousand years <laughs> uh, since those events, and so it's real easy for us in the secular West uh, to look back and go, why couldn't they have, uh, why couldn't they have seen you know, uh, these things? Why couldn't they have understood what we understand? Well, uh, we have our blind spots too because we live in the context in which we, which we live and they had theirs. And uh, it is hard for us to climb into their world where for a thousand years uh, the state and the church had been intertwined and pretty much fully so for at least 700 years. And as a result, you know, you look at someone like Wycliffe and you go, well, you know, shouldn't he have maybe stayed out of the political aspect of things? Well, uh, you know, you can, you can speculate on things like that, but the reality is he, he didn't. And very often a, a movement toward truth, such as a recognition of the faults of the papacy, 
uh, that the papacy is clearly not something that is apostolic in origination, but it's a development that takes place much later, um, had political ramifications. You couldn't avoid the political ramifications. So it's real easy to say, well, you should just you know, stick to theology and leave the politics out. Well, what if you live in a, in a context where all of politics is theological? Or can at least be made theological. And of course, we would say, you, you look at politics today, you look at the issue of abortion, and there's clear moral, ethical, and theological ramifications to all of that stuff. You can't, you know, you can, you can develop a quote-unquote radical two kingdoms theology, uh, as some people have, and, and say, I only live in this one kingdom and not in the other kingdom, but the fact is you live in this world and you are called to follow Christ in all of your life. And so Christians have come up with different ways as to how to handle that, how to respond to that. It is interesting to me, to be honest with you, in looking at the past 40 years or so uh, in the United States, uh, that a lot of very conservative uh, Christians influenced by fundamentalism and fundamentalism in its modern uh, incarnation uh, does not have a strong emphasis on church history. Um, and as a result, you end up getting uh, sort of a fundamentalist orthodoxy in the political realm that rarely takes into consideration anything about what's happened in the past. Um, especially looking back toward the time of um, even after the Reformation, because the Reformers were all sacralists. They all believed in the state church. And that's why you and I wouldn't have been welcome in uh, Wittenberg or Geneva or Strasbourg or Zurich uh, for quite some period of time. Uh, was because of sacralism, uh, the state church concept. And so uh, it just seems to me that in the modern period, people formulate much of their thinking on this matter only based upon the past, what, few generations and not having looked back over history and seen, ooh, that was a mm, bad experiment, <laughs> didn't turn out well there That's, mm, that might might give us some light as to well you don't want to go that direction Oof, the, the, it went over here too that wasn't really good that's that's not how it ends up happening unfortunately uh again just a, a plug there for why why looking at history and knowing history is uh is an important thing so anyways um his on civil dominion certainly signaled a uh willingness on Wycliffe's part to address uncomfortable issues um, and to do so with a... He's obviously not trying to make points with Rome. Uh, let's put it that way. Um, in 13, by 1378, so mo most of his major work and stuff takes place right at the end of his life. He... Because um, he dies in 1384, so uh, only last decade of his life is the primary time period where he is uh, doing some really big things. By 1378, he began publishing his doctrinal perspectives with pamphlets that attacked Roman Catholic beliefs. Uh, he began by saying that Christ alone, not the Pope, is the head of the church. Um, whenever you hear someone saying, well, Luther came up with this and Luther came up with that, most of the time there was somebody before Luther. Uh, that had come up with many of the things that he, uh, that he said, even though he may have come to those conclusions without having read them and only later reads them and goes, oh, we'll discover that happened with Jan Hus uh, as well. By 1382, he was opposing the entire doctrine of transubstantiation. Uh, two or three of you may vaguely recall that maybe decades ago, uh, on a New Year's Eve, we watched a video about John Wycliffe. Three years ago. Only three years ago? Yep. Well, we've done it more than we've done it more than once. Yes. Okay. 
Uh, well, there's only so many things you can show on New Year's Eve. Um, uh, there was that one about something in Russia that I dug up. I wish I could find it again. I don't remember where it was. Uh, but uh, some Russian martyr story or something. I wish I could find it. What? That has nothing to do with my Russian murder story. I thought you, I thought you were going to help me out here. I mean, come on, man. Wow. These guys were against the a lifeless started to be was against the Pope or started becoming against Catholicism heavily. But they still believed in a. They still believed there should be a state, more of a state combined church. Oh yeah. Not, not the Pope, not the Papacy, right? And the Pope, sorry. Papacy was a state church, but it was the wrong one, according to that. Right. Uh, oh, yeah. The, the, no one had any idea of denominations or religious freedom or anything like that. No. It was, uh, if you lived in a certain area, you were a part of the church of that area. The question is reforming that church, not allowing for the, the idea of allowing for the existence of more than one religious belief in one area was considered until well after the Reformation to be uh, societal suicide. Uh, how could how could you you function that way? There's no there's no way to have basis for law, and you, uh, how could the the magistrate uh, uh, enforce rules? Um, just it was considered to be an extremely radical idea. Yeah. No, no. As we've as we've seen uh, in looking at the development of, of papal power, uh, the 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 political aspect uh, arises uh, with the fall of the western half of the Roman Empire. Uh, but it it does not happen one day. Uh, it, no one was appointed by somebody one day. Uh, it takes uh, a tremendous amount of evolution, and it rises and falls. We saw uh, we saw. You know, uh, an emperor crawling in his knees and on his knees in the snow outside the uh, the, the pope's uh, winter uh, quarters. Uh, but then we'll we'll see uh, other kings invading Italy and taking the pope uh, captive within a hundred years of that. So, no, it's uh, no one ever said you have power. It, it was a a development. Uh, stopping and starting over uh, over time, as we as we saw as we looked at those that development that developmental period. So, um, anyways, by thirteen, so the, the, what I was I had said by thirteen eighty two, he was opposing the entire doctrine of transubstantiation. He recognized that it was a the the dogmatic definition of transubstantiation was very new. Um, it had uh, taken place only the preceding century. Um, in 1215, and so he knew, and, and this was sort of the beginning of starting to get out of that cycle of anachronism that I've told you about before, where everybody thinks everything's always been the way it is now. Um, people were starting to recognize, yeah, okay, so we teach transubstantiation today, but you, know, you go back and read people before then, and you discover that they didn't talk about this. And so you start developing this idea that ideas develop and there has been change. And it's real easy for you and I to think that way because that's what we've been raised with. And, um, but remember, during that medieval period, you know, seven miles any one direction was your world. Um, that's beginning to change. And with that change, more travel, more education, the rise of universities, uh, you have a broader foundation upon which to stand and able to see development and things like that and put yourself in a little better position to, to judge the past with a little more accuracy. Um, Wycliffe held the concept of sola scriptura, though he himself did not use the term. It is very plain that he believed that there was a special property to scripture that nothing else possesses, that because it is God-breathed, uh, that it is of ultimate authority. Um, 
In his uh, Trialogos, written shortly before his death, he wrote these words, quote, Therefore, if there were a hundred popes, and all the friars were turned into cardinals, their opinions in matters of faith should be believed only insofar as they are founded in Scripture. Uh, so that's, that's a Reformation concept uh, being enunciated in late 14th century England uh, by John Wycliffe, which is why he is, he is identified as a pre-Reformation uh, reformer. Uh, he taught that the entire Christian faith was to be found in Scripture, and because of this, he felt that people should have the Bible in their mother tongue, for every Christian was duty-bound to study it. Now, this was radical. You and I take it for granted. Uh, even from the Roman perspective of this day, this is radical, and it's the blueprint for anarchy. This is why you have all the different churches. This is why you don't have Christian unity. <clears throat> Uh, because you're giving the scripture to people uh, in this way. Wycliffe used the term sola gratia, grace alone, in defining his doctrine of justification, and he repudiated the distinction between bishop and presbyter, which again, uh, the the term presbyter had developed into the concept of priest in the 3rd and 4th centuries, even though biblically bishop and presbyter are the same thing. Um, He repudiated the distinction between bishop and presbyter, the excessive worship of images and relics, the proliferation of ceremonies, superstitious pilgrimages, and the external observance of rites generally. He finally repudiated the veneration of saints as well. Uh, So let's say Wycliffe by the end of his life uh, and Luther by the end of his life were pretty much at the same spot. Uh, Luther just started earlier on, and Wycliffe developed over time. Uh, Wycliffe was summoned to Rome a number of times. Many papal bulls were hurled against him. But England was in no mood to cooperate with Rome in the first place. Politics, politics. And in 1378, the Great Schism took place in the papacy, which diverted attention from Wycliffe. And so you've got Avignon and Rome fighting with each other. And so that loudmouth guy out in England someplace... can't really invest a whole lot of effort in him. As we'll see, that kind of political stuff was vitally important in giving Luther uh, the needed time for his own doctrinal development uh, because the papacy was distracted with other, other things. Wycliffe began a translation of the Bible in English that was condemned by the Roman church and copies were burned all over England. It was considered a vulgar language, not vulgar in the way that you and I use it, but vulgar as in inappropriate for the expression of divine truths. Uh, So it would be considered to be uh, disrespectful to Scripture uh, to render uh, God's words in such a vulgar common tongue, not recognizing, of course, that the original New Testament was written in the common Greek of the day that was spoken in the marketplaces and every place else. So that had been lost. Latin had been elevated to this very, very high uh, status. Uh, His pamphlets made their way all over Europe. Um, Very, very important, as we will see, uh, not only in his followers, called the Lollards, which we'll look at next week. Uh, No, which we will not look at next week, which we'll look at the week after that. I think so. Yeah. Anyway, I'm in Atlanta next week. Um, But um, very, very important uh, in uh, a fellow by the name of Jan Hus, who we'll look at uh, right after that. He died at Lutterworth on December 31st, 1984. He was very old. Uh, 1384. Uh, He died officially orthodox in the sense that he had not been excommunicated, uh, he had been protected by uh, a fellow by the name of John, but by the the crown as well. Um, But he was condemned 31 years later at the Council of Constance, which is the same council that will burn Jan Hus. And in 1427 or 1428, somewhere in those years, uh, as a result of his condemnation, His bones were exhumed from holy ground and burned to ashes and scattered in the river Swift. 
And of course, years later, uh, as the Reformation had taken hold and England became a non-Roman Catholic country, uh, people pointed out that uh, the River Swift uh, flows into the ocean and that by burning Wycliffe's ashes, they had, in essence, symbolized the spreading of his teaching uh, all over the world. Um, because it was his teaching that uh, deeply influenced uh, that bohemian preacher by the name of Jan Hus. And even after Hus's death at the Council of Constance in 1415, a um, hundred years later, uh, a, a Augustinian monk would uh, discover, well, actually it was 1519, uh, that Luther is challenged by being called a Hussite, a follower of Jan Hus. And uh, only then does he go to the library, read Jan Hus, and go, you're right. <laughs> uh, didn't know it, but you're right. Uh, so um, these men uh, were influenced by each other or frequently came to the same conclusions uh, independently of one another and then were encouraged by the fact they discovered that, that reality. So... We will pick up two weeks from now with the subject of the Lollards, the Lollards in, uh, in England, okay? Let's close the word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for this time. We thank you for uh, getting to a point where we're studying the breaking forth of great light by your grace. We thank you for that. We know we've been influenced deeply by that. And we just ask that you would consider, continue to give that light even as your word is proclaimed this morning in this place, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.